Are you a real estate investor looking to sharpen your skills or a newbie looking to become one? You're in the right place. Welcome to Where Should I Invest? Real Estate Investing in Canada with your host, Sarah Larby. Kellen, welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks, Sarah. I'm good. How about yourself? Good, good. I'm happy to have you back. It's been, uh, I, I want to say maybe a couple years since uh, since you came on originally. Probably at least, probably some years for sure. Because even a couple years ago, it would have been 2021. So yeah, I'm going to guess like a good while ago. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, I mean, we probably have lots of stuff to catch up on. And obviously we're in such a different time today with the rates yes. and, and the market than we were. But uh, for those that may not have uh, heard of you or know you, maybe just give us like a quick overview of what it is that you do from a real estate investing standpoint. Yeah, so um, my name is Kellen James, and I started investing in 2016. Um, at that time, I had been saving for four years just from working in the tech world, saved up every penny I could, um, and uh, bought my first duplex with 5% down, um, house hacked in that, kind of did some renos myself, you know, moved into the other side, did that sort of thing, and then started building my portfolio from there, everything after that with 20% down. And uh, I was always just focusing on the Burr strategy, and that's still what I'm doing to this day. Um, so I'm always just been, I've always just been, you know, pulling value back out of buildings, reinvesting it into the next building, and um, and doing that without joint venture partners. So I did that until I did that until 2019. At which, at which point, I had 32 units, uh, and I'd quit my day job. Um, and at that point, we traveled across the states for like three for like three months, living in a van, and. Uh, with my my now fiance and I, and uh, got back, continued to scale the portfolio from there using credit unions and uh, doing the same strategy still without partners. And at this point I have 84 units um, all in London, Ontario. Okay, awesome. So how does somebody scale to 84 units without joint venture partners? Like what was your strategy? Was it specific lenders? Like walk us through, you know, some of the insights on that. Yeah, a lot of it comes, most of it comes down to momentum. Um, if the deals aren't quite good enough, then it's going to be difficult to pull out enough money to then put into the next deal. So I had to make sure that the deals that were buying for the first, for the most part, were I was finding a lot of unicorn deals, this is what I'd call it, like the deals that if anyone were to see, of course, they would, of course, buy. Um, but the reality is a lot of those unicorn deals sometimes are sitting right on the MLS. Um, and people, it's just because they aren't seeing the opportunity in it and the potential in it. Um, so probably about half my portfolio off market, half on the market, um, just by connecting with sellers directly um, for the off market stuff. But the first 10 I got with Scotiabank, um, Scotiabank would, allows you still to this day, as of now, allows you to get up to 10 buildings, um, 10 mortgages with them. Um, and so that could be 10 fourplexes if you want. Um, and as long as each of those buildings are meeting the 50% rule, um, which would be, you know, the total gross rents divided by two minus the uh, uh, mortgage payment and the property taxes and um, heat or gas. Uh, if, if it meets that rule, then generally the property would con we'd be considered to float itself. And in the eyes of the bank, it's almost like you don't own that building. And now you're qualifying again based on basically your day job income. Um, and so uh, as long as each of my buildings was meeting that criteria, I was able to continue getting the next one. And each of those buildings... Um, I added as much value as I could by keeping renovation costs as low as I could and bumping up the after repair value as high as I could. And um, yeah, got to the first 10 with Scotiabank like that. Um, and then after that, I kind of stumbled through different lenders like Home Trust and some some quirkier stuff. And then I, and then I, I found um, credit unions. And uh, since then, I've been working uh, exclusively with different with like a few different credit unions. Um, and I found them to be um, just a lot more flexible and understanding of how these deals are structured. And, you know, they actually asked for like my bio when I first started with them, which I thought was kind of neat. So they really want to know, like, like I had one just recently, I did a refinance on the, and she was like, I just drove by the building. It looks really great. It looks like the appraisal doesn't do it justice. You can tell from the outside you've taken care of it. Like there's just more of a personal touch with, with credit unions. Um, and so you do have to expect for, you know, to now be 25% down and uh 25 year amortization and the rates are pretty similar honestly at this point to to a lenders um maybe even lower than scotia bank at this point so um that's been my strategy still is just working with credit unions and continuing um the same strategy 
So did you walk into them yourself or did you go through a mortgage broker? Because because sometimes mortgage brokers have relationships with them, but not always, right? And sometimes they're so small and they're local and they and you know they are able to do different things maybe at that level. Um, I'm yeah. a big proponent, obviously, of the mortgage broker and working with them, but there are, there are going to be some situations, I think, where, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it might be in a you know your best benefit to to go yourself. Yeah, with so for the first ten with Scotia, I generally recommend people do go directly at least once they have a few. Um, once you're at like four or five, Scotia Bank through a broker will start denying you, and then if you go direct with the right people. Uh, and with the right like bankers in Scotia, they'll be they'll be willing to continue financing up to ten. Uh, but they have rules where they don't allow that through a broker. Um, so that was sort of the situation there. And then with credit unions, um, I had a mortgage broker actually just refer me directly to at a contact at a credit union, and that was what started that ball rolling because I was calling everyone I knew to try and see what options I had for lending or for borrowing in this space you know, without day job income and still wanting to buy two to four unit buildings. Cause a lot of people would say, oh, you go into commercial at this stage. And I was like, well, I still, am, I'm really happy to continue buying two to four unit buildings. They're working well. So um, that was when I got referred to uh, someone directly at a credit union. Uh, and it was just basically a favor from the mortgage broker that got where, where she got me connected. Um, so I've been sending people to her uh, as the mortgage broker for a lot of years now because of that connection that really helped me out. But at this point, I only I only work directly with credit unions. You can work through brokers. I would say if you know what you're doing with your applications, then there's no real need to go through a broker. Um, but if someone isn't really familiar with how to best structure their applications, then it would then a mortgage broker could be helpful for that. And you just got to get ready to pay a fee um, because credit unions, um, they're they're not going to pay the broker in this like. I'm not sure, how, but I know that you have to pay the broker if you work with a, uh, um, if you work through them for uh, credit unions. And I'm not sure what the agreement is otherwise if they get paid from the credit union, but I doubt it. Yeah, I mean, I feel like many of them have different different rules and regulations around that. But you know, again, going back to like pros of of a mortgage broker, like it'll that it'll definitely help you scale in the beginning. And I think even just the private lending aspect of yes. it in commercial, once you get into commercial, if you're working with somebody that can grow with you, then there's definitely definitely benefits. But I do yeah. agree with you. Sometimes going to directly, like for example, like we refinanced our resort. Um, with a credit union and no bank would have ever touched that because no. we not we were projecting the income and so they 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 knew that right but they're yeah. like they based it off of the projected income versus the actual because any other bank you would have had to show like you know a certain time frame probably a year or two of income yeah. or refinancing um, so there are going to be some benefits for sure oh yeah and there's there's even you can even take it a step further and some credit unions will do something called a step up covenant and they'll do it based on projected income, even if you don't have a turnover yet. Um, so this unit rents for a thousand, but it could be fourteen hundred. And we see that, and hopefully you get that unit turned over at some point. And sometimes they'll actually lend based on that, um, which is which is super helpful. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, they're 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 really flexible. And I say like, um, yeah, yeah, they, they're at this point exclusively who I work with. I, there are like CMHC loans and things like that that you could you know at that point could make sense for people to work. Uh, through commercial lenders and things like that, uh, MLI select and all that. But I've actually been really a fan of just continuing with the same structure with credit units at this point. I like that if I want to refinance a couple years down the line, you know, with CMHC, it might be a little bit more difficult. You generally are going to write out that five-year term before you reapproach for a refinance. So I prefer a bit of the flexibility with this structure. And I even had um, a 24-unit apartment building that I did with a credit union. And I made the stupid decision of going variable on that mortgage. And uh, so that mortgage went up $8,000 a month in uh, this last while. So that just pulled all like, you know, of course, wiped all the cash flow. And then so I, you know, and I, I went to this lender and I said, look, I've, I've done everything a competent investor could do with this building. Um, I've turned eight of the 24 units over. Um, we're continuing that process. And of course, you see, I'm doing the same thing in the rest of my portfolio as well right now. And uh, and I asked for a one year interest only. So they converted my mortgage to interest only and they agreed, nice. they approved it for a year. Nice. Awesome. And, uh, yeah. So sometimes these little flexible strategies can be really helpful and uh, credit unions are really understanding I've found. Yeah. Now, have you found that you, you've been able to do everything with the same credit union or you've had to go and shop it around a few times? 
recently I've heard I've had to shop around a bit more. Um, I think that there are seasons with credit unions. Sometimes like there's one that I'm working with now that in years ago was not a good option, or at least mm -hmm. the contact I had there wasn't, wasn't helpful. Uh, now they seem to be more aggressive than the credit union that I have been working with for the past few years. Like I have 9 million in mortgages with one of, with one credit union. They're basically the only one I've, I've been working with this last while. Mm -hmm. Um, and now they've been a lot less uh, aggressive. So I'm moving on to a different credit union, at least for now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think I imagine that's probably going to be the way things play out for the coming years, um, just based on the season that that credit union's in, whether they're wanting to take on more debts right now um, or lo loan out more, I suppose, from their perspective. Uh, and uh, or if they want to kind of just, you know, uh, take it, take it slow and reduce risk. So. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, just a couple of other questions because I don't think we've actually ever really talked about credit unions in this in this ep this podcast awesome. in, in the last few, at least the last few years that I can think of. But you know, to, mm -hmm. to that extent. So let's just say somebody doesn't necessarily have the relationship that you've built over time. Like, how do they go about finding a credit union, and what should they look for in that person to help them? Yeah. Um, so every city is going to have different credit unions. Um, there are some, like if you're in Ontario, there's some like um, uh, Merid uh, Meridian who work basically across Ontario. Um, and then there's some that only like that, like in London area and certain things where like Libro credit union is available. There's Main Street credit union. Um, they're available in certain cities. I know there's like um, uh YNCU or something I don't know in, in other like I don't I can't deal with them because they're not in my, available in my area but there's there's you basically look up like local credit unions in your area and then just start making calls with them talk to other local investors to see if they're like see if they have good contacts because it was so funny when I ended up finding this credit union I then t spoke with other investors who've been in the game for many many years uh that I just hadn't considered asking and they're like oh yeah of course like I work with them and I'm like oh my god I just spent like months trying to figure this out and I could have just asked you um now is so, this credit union that you ended up going with London specific for your region um not specific but uh like so I have a lot with Libro um and I don't know what's what areas they cover but I know that they're that they're heavily focused in London um they have a whole bunch of branches here they might like like sometimes neighboring cities and things like that, that they'll service um main street credit union is in like chatham but they'll also do london um and then they'll do like 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 there's other like mm -hmm. you know maybe it's within a two hour one hour two hour drive of any of their branches is sort of their rule sometimes so you got to see which credit unions are uh would 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 service your neighbor your cities mm -hmm. um and then so ideally find mm -hmm. local contacts um, from other investors yeah. Cause like, I mean, I guess it's just like a mortgage broker, right? There's some like that are excellent and then some that are just yeah. getting started that don't really know what they're doing. Um, yeah. so, you know, is there, so, I mean, obviously like asking local other, inv other local investors is a great, you know, great way to find maybe someone specific at a credit union that helps. But, you know, if you really are starting from scratch and you're like, I don't really know other investors or whatnot, like, you know, is yeah. there an opportunity to ask like who's got experience with working with the most amount of investors or scaling portfolios or, yeah, you could probably ask, um, you could probably ask the credit union itself, like, you know, who's one of your like most com like, like, one of your agents that works the most with multifamily investors, but I would probably just go on local Facebook groups at this point, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not well connected and just ask, look, search previous posts for the word credit union, um, make a post, you know, and ask people if they have any contacts just on any, you know, local or Ontario Facebook groups, that sort of stuff. I'm sure all of this, um, would be out there, you know, um, mm -hmm. or DM some people, uh, DM me, you know, if you're in my area, um, you know, anyone who invests, like just, just, yeah, reach out to people. Cause I mean, if people aren't well connected, they just need to get well connected. They need to start connecting with people. Yeah, for sure. And I feel like they're all different, right? So like some of them will be, you know, maybe more investor friendly than others or require different things than others. But I think it's a good opportunity because yeah. if you don't have a T4 job or like a salary or whatnot, right? I mean, they definitely don't need, from my, my experience, don't need yeah. that per, you know, per se to qualify you even for residential. Yeah, they tend to look more at your portfolio if you have a good level of experience. I mean, if you're coming in with no job and no property and you want to buy something, like they might not be pumped about that. But, you know, you know if you have T4 income, they'll probably be extremely open to working with you. If you have a portfolio, but no T4 income, they might be open to working with you. That was my case. 
Um, so I continue to qualify with just the portfolio itself at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, even right now we have an application in for a single family home for my fiance and I, so, you know, fingers crossed, uh, they approve an application like that. Cause it's not an investment property, although we will put an Airbnb in the basin, which would be my first Airbnb because I don't do Airbnb, but in our own house, it's legal, which is nice. And it'll just make a lot of sense. Cause when we have friends and stuff over, or we're having a new year's, you know, new year's Eve party or something, we can book that night off to worry, not worry about bothering someone, you know, underneath and mm -hmm. you know, family comes over, we can have a suite available for them and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. If I if I were to like live somewhere where I would rent a portion of it, it would for sure be short term rental as well. And for yeah, because yeah, you don't want to be stuck with a horrible tenant underneath you if that if that runs that way. No, and then it's just the flexibility too, and it's the cash flow, and you know, I think like you said, like London, you know, I think Hamilton's leaning this way. As if it's your primary residence, then you know they will still allow it. And like, there's obviously yeah, some, London's like yeah, exactly. Some things you got to pay because they want to make their money, whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, exactly. Know, like aside from that, I mean, if if you're gonna do that and, and you're gonna house hack, um, that's likely how I would have house hacked, or. Yeah, uh, you know, if you're a student or you're younger and you don't mind people like sharing a bathroom in the kitchen, I mean, these are not RTA tenants at that point in time, so that could be another yeah good way to house hack. I, exactly, and with this place, what the plan is is to add this Airbnb suite and then uh, also potentially add an ADU uh, mm, in behind. Nice. And we've never done an I've never done an ADU and I've never done an Airbnb. Um, I've always just done long term rentals and stuff. But um, if we can add the ADU, we may potentially have two income suites for a period of time. And then, you know, when, maybe when we start a family in the next couple of years, we can maybe move into that basement as, as our own. You know, we'll have those extra bedrooms and bathrooms and then have the ADU still as the income suite um, sort of separated, maybe fenced off sort of thing. Um, so mm -hmm. we still have an income suite, but we have the whole house to ourselves. So trying to build some kind of structure that would be flexible with us uh, over the coming years. Yeah, for sure. And if you're like going to have some kids down the road and you want your like nanny there or a parent to help. <laughs> exactly. Know? They're not exactly. all in your space. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And and what a win-win for, for them and us to be able to, yeah, if we could do that. So, you yeah, know, friends coming over and stuff, it'd just be nice. Yeah. You got your own unit. Don't worry about it. You know, um, mm -hmm. And like, you know, maybe you're sending the cleaner in to do the theory of me, but they're also cleaning your unit, you know, like <laughs> there's, there's benefits, all, of, benefits all yeah. around for sure. And yeah. I think, I think just uh, last week, actually, there was another case law in our favor from an Airbnb standpoint that uh, um, went to court because there was somebody that was there for a few months and tried to pull the tenant card and it was actually ruled that it was not a tenant because it was through the, a platform. Yeah. That's so like, great. that's, that's good for us, which means that like, you know, you could use that case law moving forward. Should somebody try to play that card? Um, again, yeah. there's not, there's always like going to be like some, you know, I'm sure some, some exceptions and, and whatnot, but you know, that, yeah. that was ruled that like, you know, on that platform was not, uh, that's fantastic. RTA, that's fantastic. That's yeah. fantastic. That's great news. Cause I know that was a big fear. A lot of people had with the long, you know, it's nice if you can have someone rent, I imagine, I don't really know a lot about Airbnb, but I imagine it's nice if someone could rent it for two months and, you know, you get great income and not need to worry about turnovers and stuff during that time. And for this yeah. now to not have to worry as much about LTT, like the landlord tenant board. Yeah, I'm sure there's like exceptions it. and loopholes or whatever, but at least it's like a step in, in the right direction. You yeah, know? for sure. Which, yeah, which my paralegal sent to me. He's like, hey, good news. Like, mm -hmm. check this out. This I think it was like June 17th or whatever that it came out. I'm like, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is huge news and it's good news for for people who want to use airbnb as well because they might want something for two three months while they're transitioning or something they don't need to worry about you know uh having to move halfway into a different place or something like that so mm, yeah. yeah i mean it's the spirit of it's really it's following the, it seems like the case law is following more of the spirit of the law there which is good um mm -hmm. you know yeah now at least for now <laughs> So, for now. so I want to talk, I want to switch it up a little bit because I know we're, you know, kind of um, coming up on time soon, but, you know, 2023, I think has been just a, a weird year. It's been an odd year with the rates going up so high, so quickly. Um, and I will say that, like, when you look back at 2021, you know, they basically told us it was going to be low forever. So they totally lied to us regardless, yeah. but it is what it is. Like, I'm not surprised. Um, this is yeah. the government's doing and, and everything, but 
what are you doing from a real estate standpoint? Like how are you mitigating risk? What happened to your portfolio? Like I know you mentioned obviously like your cash flow dwindled away with that, you know, that variable option, but maybe just give us insights yeah. on what you're doing as an investor with, you know, multiple doors. Um, you've been doing this for for a while now as well, and, and maybe some tips and insights for others. Yeah. So I've been in stabilization mode for a while. Um, I actually bought so I sold some buildings and then bought a bunch in 2021. So I bought 51 units in 2021, uh, right before the rates started, uh, kind of right before the rates start, started climbing. So, and I had some, I had a bunch of variables. So I've been well exposed to this. Um, luckily, my portfolio was extremely high cash flow before all of this. Um, so <clears throat> it basically wiped it all and then kind of brought it into the negative uh, overall. But then I've been turning units over and it's all right around floating itself um, at this point with some pretty decent exposure to um to these interest rates um because i had a lot of i had a, a i had a bunch of variables and then i also had a bunch that have since refinanced at current rates and this sort of stuff so i mean there's a lot of people who aren't aware that in the next two three years there's going to be a ton of people that have to renew and that's going to have its effect on the market um but i've been stabilizing so that was a big part of my plan for the, like, well, that's what the last 12 months have been essentially, um, which is what I would have done almost regardless of what the market's been doing, because when you buy that many units, you need to take the time to have a stabilization period before you continue acquiring. Uh, otherwise things get a little rocky if you just keep acquiring while you have a bunch of low rents. Um, so, you know, I've been, I, when it comes to like what the future holds with all the interest rates and things like that in the market, um, I'm, you know, there's two ways to look at it, right? Is one, you know, okay, maybe things get better and we want to have exposure to the market and we want to see, you know, if things go up, we want to ride that wave up. But if things go down, we don't want to be too exposed. So finding that balance of exposure is, I guess, the goal. Um, and so for me, um, that meant this last while actually selling off a couple of uh, small buildings that I had in my portfolio, a duplex and a triplex, and just paying off a bunch of loans just to get to a less leveraged position. So that I feel more comfortable with where things are at. Um, I've no, I noticed that for myself. I've been wanting to, I've been wanting to feel more stable uh, in in the coming years. So I think that's what is really going to set apart uh, competent investors in the long run is uh, being able to make it through times like this. Um, and so, for me, it's been finding that sweet spot of exposure to the market and making sure that um, I continue turning units over using cash for keys for the most part and uh, getting rents up so that, you know, I'm able to ride through a long period of high interest rates if that is the way things go, but mm -hmm. still have a good size portfolio so that I have exposure to the market if we happen to see the government start printing money again and causing another inflation spike, which I do think is highly probable uh, at some point in the coming years. Uh, an inflationary spike would mean real estate goes up in value again, but who knows? And I'm just expecting something like that ha to happen in the coming five years at some point. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, if there is something is that to, to keep in mind is that we we really don't know what the future is, right? So you want to plan for the good, you want to plan, plan for the bad, you want to stabilize as much as possible. And very similar to you, you know, like in a lot of my stuff, was variable and and a lot of stuff yeah. actually is still variable but luckily Sucks. It, it was always very okay with cash flow um and yeah. and i think that that was a big a big piece of it is you know if like if you had bought something for like you know let's just say a condo in toronto for 800 grand and you were already like negative 500 like yeah that that would really suck oh uh, yeah but i think you know i think because I always, you know, looked at cash flow, you know, similar to you, I like to, you know, replace the tenants as often as possible to reset the rents, um, you know, when, when they leave or whatnot, but um, that was a big thing. And then just converting and, and doing more units in a, in a property versus prior. I think that was a big one switching to midterm on some things. And that makes sense in those areas. I think that was a, bi a big one for the midterm, short-term stuff, but mm -hmm. you know, and then the ones that I had fixed, ironically there I didn't have too many but they were all came due and I had to renew anyways so uh, I know, know right it is and they have equity you want to access the equity so you're going to at some point refinance these anyway I, I'm actually a little to some degree grateful that we've had that exposure we've already kind of taken the hit you know um, mm. um and so now we can adapt from here there's people who haven't taken the hit yet um well that's, it might be a that's shock the to them. scary that's the scary part is you know and we're investors and you know and, and like again like we're not you know by any means, uh, 
going to, to all coast through this 100% of us. But yeah, I, you know, I worry about the average person who has bought in 2020, 2021 with a fixed income um, yeah. that, you know, maybe they had a million dollar mortgage that, you know, literally that, that difference between the two uh, is quite high. And so when it's going to be time to renew, like that could be thousands of dollars more per month. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's the scary part. And then, so like, they're going to sell potentially. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so who's going to buy it and what price are they going to sell? Are they going to take a loss? Where are they going to go? What the, What's going to happen to the rental market? Like there's so many, there's so many questions. I don't think we've seen the whole aftermath. If the rates are not going to drop at some point soon, where we haven't seen the aftermath, I think we're still in it for, you know, a surprise. However, I will say this, you know, and I, and I, I think you're, you're similar, but I always bought at the bottom third of the, of the market. I always bought the shit that people didn't want. I was just going to say this. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and I think yeah. that that will help because as people sell their, you know, bigger properties, they're going to need to downsize. It'll likely. Exactly. I was going to say exactly the same thing. Yeah. 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 And there, the, things can only go so low. There is like a bottom. It's sort of like, you know, if you have a bachelor unit um, for rent, like mm -hmm. it's always going to be like, like it's always going to be in demand because there's always people who need that, that bottom of it, bottom option. Right. And yeah, if people are exiting from these $1.3 million places and they might need to get into that, like, you know, $500,000 range or whatever. It's like, okay, like that demand will sort of like, I, it'll, it'll, it'll have more holding power, I think a little, you know, versus, and, and we've yeah. seen that historically in the real yeah, estate look, market. Look at 20, oh. was it 2017 when Kathleen Wynn tried to do this nonsense of like this fair housing thing and actually ruined the market in a sense, but yeah. it actually ruined the top tier I didn't feel yeah. anything when I was, you know, buying my, my crappy properties and fixing yeah. them. <laughs> no, exactly. that helped. <laughs> well, you even look like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you even look in like, like London, Ontario, like the North end, you can see, I look, I saw the stats recently and like it had dropped over some period of time, like 15%. Whereas like the East end, it only dropped like 9% or whatever. And it's like, well, that's because the East end is kind of the crappier end of town, but it obviously, it didn't it didn't get hit as hard either. So, I mean, there's no. a huge advantages to that. But. And it is interesting too, because you think like there's a lot of investors, you know, and I, I sold a couple as well. Like it sounds like you sold a couple things. Um, yeah. You know, we're, we're selling our loss leaders. We're not going to keep these, you know, necessarily if there's an opportunity to buy, you know, better or whatnot. And yeah. I think a lot of investors are selling right now for whatever reasons. Sometimes they just don't cash flow and they're like, I'm going to cut my losses or whatnot. But like that is depleting the inventory of rental stock. And at the same time, we're having a lot more people coming into the country. So, you know, yeah. as people are now maybe selling down the road because they can't afford it, um, maybe they're going to need to rent. Like, I just don't see this rental market going so well for renters. I think it's going to go well for us <laughs> as yeah. investors you yeah. know, from a, you know, a market rent standpoint, but I don't think it's crazy that we'll have a country of renters, you know, in 20 years, um, like the vast majority of people renting. Um, mm -hmm. And so the demand for one and two bedroom apartments is is going to be insane and already is. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, just like if you're an index fund investor and you need to be able to ride through the downturns, um, you know, with index funds, you do that by just holding. Mm -hmm. uh, with real estate, you do that with cash flow. So that's why it's so important to have buildings that have solid income the best you can so that you can have that holding power to ride through these downturns, just like you would with an index fund. So you don't have to sell. I mean, we, we sold a couple just to feel safe and stabilized, but we also had large portfolios that we could do that. Um, but, you know, ideally we want to be able to just hold this real estate over the long run. And mm -hmm. um, that's what you do. That's how you do that through cash flow, whether that's through whatever form of income that you're the way you're running that building. Um, you need some, we need these ways to be able to, to hold our buildings for the long run. And, and, and the reason that we're doing that is because m people don't talk about being bullish right now in the market. But like when we talk about Ontario 20 years from now, most people are like, oh yeah, like I, th I can see it being pretty expensive real estate 20 years from now. It's mm -hmm. because we understand that like, yeah, we're going through a time right now. Um, mm -hmm. But if we really look in the long-term future, like Ontario real estate is going to be in massive demand. Um, and we know this. So we need holding power now to yeah, keep so what we have and and uh, and and find ways to acquire in a safe manner that we can ride through difficult times in the short term. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you this. You're not a realtor, correct? 
No, I am. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna grab my license now. I'm in the middle. Okay, but hang stuff. on, because because yeah, I actually I, like I want you to not be a realtor right now. But I'm not a realtor. Okay. <laughs> so from a non-realtor, just a strictly an investor standpoint, I just want to make sure you're not biased. To my next yeah. question is, yeah, you no. Know, so we're in 2023. You are not a realtor. You're a real estate investor. And from a real estate investor perspective, um, what do you think people should be doing? Should they be buying? Should they be waiting on the sidelines? Should they be liquidating? Like, what are some of your insights and your thoughts? And what are you doing yourself? Yeah, I would say more than ever right now, it makes sense to really make sure the properties are cash flowing if you're going to take on acquisitions. Um, This has always been the intention. Uh, A lot of people, the, the competent investors in the past understood that like, Cash flow is what affords you holding holding power so that you can ride through these situations. So if people are making sure that they're taking their, that any acquisitions they do take on have, I guess what I would call like a triple combo of like buying it under market value, forcing appreciation, maybe four things, um, cash flow, and ideally some degree of predictability built into the deal. So one or two vacant units, that sort of thing. Um, that would that I think would be a, uh, what a competent investor would look for at this stage of the game. So off market, maybe you can find these opportunities, and then on market, low balling probably on listings or finding opportunities that people just don't see otherwise. Um, maybe listings that have no photos or just you know have super low rents, but maybe there is actually opportunity for turnovers there. Um, so it's going to be depending on like if someone's an investor that's buying their first one or two buildings. In that case, predictability I would highly value. Um, because you don't want to get stuck in that first one or two buildings. If someone's got a decent sized portfolio under their belt, maybe they're a little more willing to take on risk and then they can take on buildings that don't have quite as much of a degree of predictability, but will likely still work in the long term, like five, 10, 20 year period type of thing. Um, and they can ride through situations for the next few years if uh, if rates don't drop at some point. Um, so really, we want to be able to withstand both scenarios is the way that I would approach it. Um, and that's the way I am approaching it. So I've been stabilizing for quite a while and I'm just going to, for now, continue to do so for the coming months. Um, but it's because I've, I have an eight plex. I just turned, you know, seven out of the eight units over on, and we're going to rip through and renovate all those now. And there's no point in me taking on acquisitions while I'm in the middle of a project like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I, I am a big believer in long-term, but I think even more so now, more important than ever. There's going to be some strategies that I probably would not recommend uh, in today's world. And those are a lot, you know, around the short term types of things like, you know, there's, I and I never really liked this strategy, but that whole, you know, buying uh, pre-construction and hoping to sign it and close on it with appreciation. Like, I don't know where that's going to actually be. Uh, and yeah. if that's a, you know, and again, probably not a strategy that I personally would want to be doing flipping. I probably, and I know there's going to be some people that are like, I'm doing so well with flipping. I think it's a little bit riskier if you don't have another exit strategy at the end, should you not be able to sell yeah. for the price that you want. So, you know, I do agree with you. Like, I think like flipping multifamily. Yeah. Flipping sure. multifamily could be an interesting in between. I don't really hear a lot of people talking about that, but that way you can hold if needed. Yeah, like exactly. Like something that has that, you know, try to try to do your best to, yeah. Exit strategy for sure. Yeah, we got a delay. (laughs) I know, I know we can't win here. So for those of you that are listening, and I'll (laughs) keep this on, we, uh, this is like two hours later. This is why there's a different decor in the background, but um, because we had this huge storm that was messing up with the internet and uh, now it's messing up with the delays. (laughs) Uh, hours later as we were resuming the podcast but all good all good Um, but I do agree with you I think multifamily is probably going to be um, almost like a a better strategy than it has been even in the past not that it wasn't good in the past it was great in the past but I think with the MLI select program from CMHC and a few other things that are coming down the pipes I think that's a really great opportunity even more so because of the like the different programs that are available and it is long term. Um, so there's lo- there's lots of pros and cons. Um, you know, any other strategies that you're like, hey, guys, like be a little careful on this or maybe this like or vice versa. Like this is a great one that I'm like starting to look at. Um, I've honestly always only really looked at things that would work in the long term. Personally, there's lots of there's lots of waves. I think we've been able to see people ride over the over the last five years, seven years kind of thing. Um, you know, and, and there are, there were those opportunities coming along that people were able to ride up 
But um, these are kind of like short spikes, you know, one to three year type of waves. I've always been looking at the long term. So it's always been about like long term buy and hold multifamily. Um, so that's that's still what I focus on. That's what I'm going to continue focusing on. I think that like, you know, within that space, you know, um, two to four unit stuff is has a bunch of advantages in terms of liquidity you know you can really li liquefy those a lot easier they're a lot, they're easier to sell um you can kind of expand and contract as needed which might be a really useful thing um to ride through you know boom bust cycles um, whereas apartment buildings you know you can do the same but you need to make sure you have liquidity to, in order to do so um so i think that um that's the space that i'm going to continue focusing on um and then combining it with active income i think would be a decent way to approach this stuff um so, you know, whatever that might be, some people are going to have their realtor license, people are doing coaching, people have a job, people have businesses, you know, um, I think that combo is a really, is a really good one. Um, gives you kind of cash now for your lifestyle and you're continuing to focus on like the highest and best use uh, of your money when it comes to investments over the long term. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Some, some definitely great, great insights. So we're going to wrap it up. We're going to do our lightning round uh, and uh, everybody gets the same questions. You probably answered these years ago when you were on initially, I want to say it was like <laughs> 2019, 2018. I, I don't remember, but it's been a while. Um, so I'm sure your answers yeah. have changed along the way or maybe not. We'll see. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you ready to play? Yeah, for sure. All right. So here's question number one. Was your favorite real estate investing book? Um, I haven't really enjoyed, I, I bet I said the same thing years ago. I haven't really had investing books that I've really enjoyed. It's been more, I'm sure you get this answer all the time, podcasts and YouTube and that sort of stuff. Books are a little bit more of a mindset type of thing for businesses, um, sales type of stuff. So, um, so I, I, I've always liked books like, uh, extreme ownership. Uh, I do a lot of like stoicism books from Ryan, Ryan holiday, like ego is the enemy and still misses the key and all those. Um, but I haven't, I don't have any real estate books in particular that I like other than sort of like rich dad, poor dad type of stuff. That's, you know, kind of like real, kind of like self-improvement porn, I guess, or like financial porn where it's just like, eh, like, I mean, it's good for someone just starting out, but of course for us, it's just maybe just like a, it's fun to read. And it's like a quick reminder of why we're doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm, for sure. All right, cool. So number two, not real estate specific. Do you have a favorite podcast? Oh, interesting. Um, huh, that's a good question. I haven't been doing a lot of podcasts this last while. I used to like Freakonomics and Radiolab. Um, those were good for like science-y type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I but though, I haven't really been doing a lot of podcasts otherwise. I mean, podcasts, for the most part, I only do... I, I mean, Rogan stuff is good. Um, I should probably listen to like more of Tim Ferriss's stuff and and anything else with David Goggins. <laughs> yeah. I like him too. I like his book too. Yeah. All right. Oh question. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> question number three, what do you do for fun? Um, uh, we do a lot of travel 2022. Um, my fiance and I went to Norway, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Costa Rica, um, trip out to the Eastern Canada. So we do a, a ton of travel. Um, I was really into chess for a while there for like a good six months. I was playing chess a lot on my phone and, 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 uh, getting better at that. Um, exercise, walking, walking the dog. Um, and I really enjoy work. Work is luckily something I look forward to, to doing. So, um, that's a big part of when I wake up in the, in the morning, it's like, I'm pumped to work on this today. So yeah. <laughs> Very cool. I think that's a chess board in the background, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome, yeah. awesome. All right. Number four, if you lost everything tomorrow, all your properties, your money, your assets, how would you start again? Um, I would start with five percent down on a duplex or ten percent on a triplex or fourplex, and I would house hack in one of the units, rent the others, try and get something under val under market value, force appreciation, and I would probably combine it with a purchase plus improvements mortgage so that I could um, pull out my renovation money. Um, and I would spend, I would, I would live on rice and beans and save as much as possible because momentum in the early days matters. Uh, the momentum of your money in the early days matters more than it does in the later days to some degree, because you want to start that compounding, um, mm -hmm. as fast as possible and start that, start that process rolling. 
All right. Great answer. And number five, if somebody has $50,000 and I kept the same number on purpose, but now it gets harder and harder to make this work. But if somebody has $50,000, they want to get started. How would you recommend they spend that money? Um, I would do the exact same thing I just said. So like, luckily 50,000 still works with that strategy mm -hmm. because, um, 5% down on a $500,000 duplex would be 40 grand. Um, so that's still a manageable strategy. You know, you could potentially use uh, unsecured lines of credit um, or private money from friends or family in order to do the renovations and then get the money back through the purchase plus improvements mortgage. Um, so that strategy actually still works even with only 50 grand. Okay. All right. Great answer. Thanks for playing the lightning round. Kellen, where can my listeners reach out and find out more? Um, my website, kellenjames.ca. And then I'm on Instagram as Kellen James and TikTok and YouTube shorts and all that stuff. And that's where I have my mentorship program as well. I worked, worked with people for six months and I have masterminds as well that I'm running in like the spring and fall where I get a bunch of people together and we uh, learn for eight weeks together on like Tuesday or Thursday nights. All right. Very cool. And that's all the info is on your website? Yep. It's all there. Okay. All right. Well, Kellen, thanks for being on the show and thanks for your patience as well as I uh, <laughs> was having issues with the first time we recorded this and we had to pause because the the crazy storm. But uh Thanks for, thanks for coming back and, uh, you know, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much there. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to Where Should I Invest with your host, Sarah Larvey. Make sure to listen in next time. We'll catch you on the next episode of Where Should I Invest.